I'm pleased that someone um, giggled when they heard Dismembering the Male. It's still my favourite title of all times. Look, I'm really, um, <laughs> I'm really thrilled um, to, um, to be invited to, sp uh, to speak today, in part because um, many, many years ago, I was in Australia, in Canberra, just finished my PhD and just got my first um, lectureship, and um, I really wanted to come to Europe. And there was one city I wanted to go to, and that was Edinburgh. And do you realize, over a year and a half, 18 months, you did not have one job I could apply for. <laughs> um, so I ended up um, going elsewhere. <laughs> um, but I've always loved Edinburgh. It's, I think it's a great city. OK, what I want to talk about today is my new work. And you know, this is very much work in progress. Um, thanks, I recently uh, was awarded a welcome grant to write a history of pain. So. You are my first audience, so I really am looking forward to feedback, um, particularly, um, I, know, I know there's some medics here, so particularly um, from you, because it'd be really, really uh, helpful for me. Um, Margaret Edson's play, Wit, uh, with the semicolon there, um, in this play, a bald Vivian Baring walks on stage in her hospital gown and pick it up, pushing an ivy pole, and she complains, I have been asked, how are you feeling today? While well, I was throwing up in a plastic wash basin. I had been asked as I was emerging from a four hour operation with a tube in every orifice. How are you feeling today? I am waiting. I am waiting for the moment when someone asks me this question and I am dead. I'm a little sorry I'm going to miss that. She went on to lament the barrenness of metaphorical languages um, available for people experiencing uh, stage four cancer, ovarian cancer, instead of the opulent, dramatic, theatrical languages of the fairy queen, um, uh, bearing as a prof professor of uh, late 16th and 17th century uh, poetry. Her suffering generated a theater replete with, in her words, threadbare metaphor of the sands of time slipping through the hourglass, as she acknowledged with bitter humor. At this moment, however, I am disinclined to poetry. I've got less than two hours, then curtains. Bering's complaint about the feigned solicitude of people observing pain and the threadbare narratives um, open to those experiencing it have, of course, entered the cliches of illness, the canon of cliches of illness. Answering that question, well, how are you feeling today, is a dilemma, of course, faced by pain sufferers throughout the centuries. Most famously, literary scholar Elaine Scarry responded by stating that the question was unanswerable. Pain exists outside of language. It is essentially private, untransmittable. Scarry went even further. Uh, stating that physical pain does not simply resist language but actively destroys it, bringing, bringing about an immediate reversion to a state anterior to language, to the sounds and cries a human being makes before language is learnt. Unlike other conscious states, she continued, pain has no referential content. It is not of or for anything. It is precisely because it takes no object that it, it, more than any other phenomenon, resists objectification in language. Now, of course, such an argument is really deeply disconcerting to an historian um, of pain. Um, bluntly, it actually eliminates uh, my inquiry before I even start the project. <laughs> um, it is also, obviously, I, I believe, wrong. Jeffrey um, L. Um, Harpin rightly, as Jeffrey Harpin rightly observes, Scarry's argument is counterfactual. In his words, Scarry treats as an immediate and monochrome physical experience, a baseline of reality, what in fact is a combination of sensations, dispositions, cultural circumstances and explanations, a phenomenon involving body, mind and culture. She has, in other words, misconceived the character of pain precisely by giving it a character, by treating it as a fact, a brute fact, and the first and final fact, rather than an interpretation. In other words, Scarry has fallen into the trap of treating metaphoric ways of interpreting pain as accurate, unassailable, um, and unmediated descriptions of that pain.
That is, in other words, metaphorically, pain is treated as an independent entity inside, within a person. As in, I think, my famous humorous sketch, um, simply entitled The Pain, 1927, which simply states, um, anxious mother, you don't look well, Johnny. Are you in pain? Johnny, no, mummy, the pain's in me. For Scarry, this metaphor is actually literalized. Pain, rather than the person in pain, is given agency. As I'll be arguing in the next 40 minutes, metaphors and those other linguistic strugglings to talk about pain that, emer that engages the attention of both the fictive character Vivian Baring and the literary critic Elaine Scarry actually does provide the historian with a way to show how embodied experience, show the embodied experience of people and how this embodied experience of people in pain has a history that is profoundly variable over temporal and geographical space. In contrast to Scarry's assertion that pain actively destroys language, the experience of pain can actually generate language. In fact, the eloquence of some people when they seek to convey their inflictions to family, friends and physicians can be very striking. In her essay on being ill, 1930, Virginia Woolf also lamented the poverty of the language of pain because there's nothing ready made. But this could be an advantage, she went on, since the person in pain is forced to coin words himself, taking his pain in one hand and a lump of pure sound in the other, as perhaps the people of Babel did in the beginning, so as to crush them together that a brand new word in the end drops out. Pain talk is swollen with analogy, metaphor, metonym. There are vast theological, medical, imaginative, philosophical traditions that people grasp to enable them to communicate their pain to themselves and to others. Crucially, uh, these uh, um, traditions have a complex history. Furthermore, why it would be rash, indeed it would be downright silly, to deny the profound sense of alienation often faced, not always, but often faced by people in pain, Scarry is insufficiently attuned to the fundamentally social aspects of pain, both in the past and today. Even when suffering, in other words, people adhered to societal norms and rituals. They were often highly expressive in creating, in, in uh, communicating their suffering, sometimes in words, sometimes images and art, other times in gestures, ritual utterances, utterances, symbols, posture, performance. Metaphorical languages were particularly important in conveying the feeling of pain. And the way these, one of my project is, is looking at how these metaphorical languages changed over historical time, enabling historians to access states of pain. I'm going to be arguing that an exploration of the languages and especially the metaphors and metonyms of pain enable us to grasp the sensation, uh, enable us to grasp how the sensation of pain has changed over time. Now, some historians claim that any study of pain is nothing more than a study of representation. Um, wholly detached, if you like, from um, anything that might approximate lived experience. According to this critique, language is about nothing other than itself, or in another version, it wholly constitutes experiences. And Thomas Sordis um, has, I think, a really nice retort to this, the philosopher, reminding us that the, the polarization of language and experience is itself a function of a predominantly representational theory of language. However, it's perfectly possible, indeed plausible, to argue that language gives access to a world of experience insofar as experience comes to or is brought to language. The notion that language is, in it, is itself a mode of being in the world is perhaps best captured in the Heideggerian notion that language not only represents and refers but discloses our being in the world. In this way, the body is not only a receptacle of sensations, but also a material process that is intrinsically social and interactive. And there are going to be a few parts to my argument here. The first is the difficulty of talking about any intense um, subjective experiences. Second is 
which is the boring bit, so just bear with me. <laughs> it's, it's necessary, unfortunately. Why metaphor is important, um, particularly because metaphors weave together bodily sensation and cognition. The third part of my argument is um, how the body is not universal. Um, there are sufficient, significant differences in the metaphors applied to the body across cultures. And I'm going to move very quickly from there to how this we can understand how metaphors differ within Anglo-American um, societies um, from the mid-18th century um, onwards. Some consistent metaphors, but also some that disappear and others that appear suddenly. Um, the fifth uh, point is the role of gesture um, in, in communicating uh, pain. And finally, the extent to looking at to what extent has narrative and gesture declined in significance. So first, the subjective experience of, um, that all subjective experience um, defies easy communication. It is, of course, a cliche, writing about pain, that it's difficult, if not impossible, to recall the sensation of bodily torment. In the words of, now we're on to her, <laughs> uh, the author Harriet Martineau, writing in the 1840s after suffering, of course, many years of excruciating pain, she wrote, but where are these pains now, not only gone but annihilated? They are destroyed so utterly that even memory can lay no hold upon them. The fact of their occurrence is all that even memory can preserve. The sensations themselves cannot be retained, nor recalled, nor revived. They are the most absolutely effervescent, the most essentially and complete destructive, uh, destructible of all things. This pain, um, which I feel now as I write, I have felt innumerable times before and a few hour, hours hence, I shall be as incapable, incapable, to, re I think it's maybe in, <laughs> incapable um, to represent it to myself as to the healthiest person in this house. The struggle involved in attempting to put into words the sensation of pain is, of course, indisputable. I'm, I'm not disputing that at all here. But pain, of course, is not the only feeling state that is difficult to communicate. People struggle to translate all strong sensations. Direct categor categorical language may be elusive in pain communication, but it is elusive in attempts to convey feelings of orgasmic delight or parental love as well. Memories of pain, as with all memories of acute emotional and sensual experiences, are notoriously difficult to render into language. And here, you know, I keep thinking, um, you know, maybe that explains why there's so many contenders for awards for bad sex writing. Now, I think there, however, are at least two reasons why pain might be considered particularly, especially difficult to communicate to others. Firstly, unlike pleasant feeling states, painful ones might be particularly humiliating um, or shameful. And this is what Robert Davis was alluding to in 1897 when he described the reaction of a naval officer who had, quote, repeatedly screamed during an operation. Afterwards, with haggard features and striking fa fra frame, the officer had gone around and apologized to everyone uh, present for not being able to control the, my expression of unendurable pain. The second reason that makes pain a particularly difficult sensation to convey in contrast to other sensations, powerful sensations, is of course because of the potency of both the sufferer's and the audience's imaginations. Pain narratives resurrect the pain for those who suffer it. And this is what I think an unnamed physician writing at the beginning of the 19th century uh, meant. He was forced to undergo a major operation without anesthetics. He admitted that, although he could not express his suffering in words, incidentally, they always start with, I can't express it, and they go on lengthy dis expressions. <laughs> I cannot express it in words. The memory of everything surrounding the operation was clear in his mind, and, according to him, constituted an experience, the experience of suffering in itself. He recalled that during the operation, my senses were preternaturally acute. He, quote, watched all that the surgeon did with a fascinated intensity. I still recall with unwelcome vividness the spreading out of the instruments, the twisting 
of, of the bandages, the first incision, the fingering of the sword bone, the sponge pressed on the flap, the tying of the blood vessels, the stitching of skin, and the bloody, dismembered limb lying on the floor. He admitted that these were not pleasant remembrances, but they haunted him for a long time, and even now they are easily resuscitated. Crucially, though, he went on to say that although these memories cannot bring back the suffering attending the events which gave them a place in my memory, they occasion a suffering of their own and be the cause of a disquiet which favours neither mental nor bodily health. His preternaturally acute, that's his term, um, sense of being at a distance from his own bodily agony conveyed at least a component of that original sensation. Pain and narratives could also torture, of course, the listeners as well. As one working class patient recalled about his residence in the Manchester infirmary in the 1830s, when a house surgeon, um, a gentleman of fine feelings, mistakenly caused another patient, quote, such strong pain that the man stamped his foot with violence upon the floor, cursing the doctor to his face. And the doctor, much moved, sat down and, I like this one, in a flood of tears said, I wish my father had apprenticed me to a chimney sweeper. Particularly when physical agony was being communicated to family, to friends, intimate uh, people, there was good reason, in fact, for the person in pain to silence herself, to refuse to become an inflictor as well as a sufferer of pain. Thus, in the memoir of the last illness and death of Rachel Betts, 1834, Rachel Betts suffered excruciating pain and afterwards observed her sister weeping. She was mortified, admitting that, I cannot help expressing how great my pain is. It seems a relief. However, she added, but I do not want to distress thee, and so resolved not to speak or utter or display her agony again. Short time later, when her mother asked her if she continued easier, Betts simply replied, quite easy. Attempts to translate vivid, pleasurable sensations into language might be halting, might be cliché-ridden, drawn from Romeo and Juliet, but they still, of course, provoke a warm glow of recognition in listeners. In contrast, pain narratives could provide, at best, shameful titillation and, at worst, agony for bystanders. Physicians and patients alike are dependent upon metaphor for communicating their pain, like all experiences, but especially those in which we find difficult, subjective, conceptual, um, engaging the senses in an intense fashion. Pain certainly fits all of them. Um, in those circumstances, people turn to metaphor. Metaphorical language is profoundly useful in enabling people to communicate difficult things. They are a heuristic device. Um, but they are more than just heuristic, they're more than just illustrative. They help constitute the reality of suffering. Because, uh, because metaphors help constitute uh, the experience and are most often used when attempting to convey those experiences most resistant to expression, they provide important clues to unspoken meanings. Indeed, because pain narratives are most often fragmentary, rather than elaborate accounts, the use of metaphor is particularly resident, resident, resonant um, of experience. What do these metaphorical descriptions mean and why are they so central uh, to our understanding of pain experiences? As long ago as 1890, um, in a book, it will be familiar to some people here, um, by George Laktoff and Mark Johnson called Metaphors We Live By, um, they famously argued that metaphor is not just a matter of language, that is, of mere words. Human thought processes are largely metaphorical. They also made the crucial point that metaphors are based on embodied experiences. And elsewhere, I've written a, a theoretical um, piece about this, which is really long and boring. <laughs> but I'm going to just give you two paragraphs of it here, so just bear with me um, for a minute because it's actually crucial to the argument. Basically, one of the two things I'm arguing is first, that one of the main reasons why metaphorical languages are so important is because they weave together bodily sensation and cognition. 
from Plato to Descartes and everyday speech today, body and mind have been conceived of as two very different entities. In this model, the mind is generally represented as some sort of superior, disembodied, computational um, entity, which then feeds information to a passive, universal physiology. People's, um, uh, but people's embodied experiences give rise to metaphorical structurings of um, abstract concepts. An exploration of metaphor unravels this mind-body distinction, revealing the body to be mindful and the mind to be embodied. In other words, there's interaction taking place. As a consequence, there is no need to draw a distinction between physiology and cultural construction, since body, mind, and environment are always in interaction. Secondly, the meaning through language, through gesture, given to pain expresses the feeling of pain. In other words, the subjective character of experience, its phenomenological content, does not simply arise from interactions um, in the world, but is constituted by those interactions. And the other aspect to this, the final aspect, is by tracing how these different metaphors and languages change over time, we can make um, statements about how sensation, feeling, actually has a history. That's the end of that bit. <laughs> um, it might be objected, however, that this approach to pain um, threatens to universalize the body and flattens out pain descriptions. After all, critics might men maintain, isn't the physiological body the same everywhere, all times? If metaphors are drawn from corporeal realities, then the experience of pain becomes trans-historical, the greatest crime for an historian, and transnational. And I think the response to this can be twofold. The first response simply observes that human physiology is, of course, not universal. Uh, the universal human body has generally been predicated upon the male exemplar and a particular particular positioning of bone, tissue, muscles, fluid, fat. However, human physiology is much more diverse in shape and function, female, male, abled, disabled, and has changed over historical time, life expectancy. Medical advances have profoundly altered the physiology of the body and the way that body exists in the world. Different bodies feel different, and we would expect to see metaphors reflecting those differences. The second response, which is the more historical response, refers to the fundamentally social na nature of language. Embodiment does not emerge fully formed out of an individual's head, but out of interaction between uh, the social worlds and environments. Bodily sensation do not emerge newly formed from the complex interaction between simply an individual's physiology and her environment, but a forged in interaction um, uh, with others. Embodied experiences are all shaped by environmental context and cultural processes, which include language and dialect, power relations, um, we can talk about that later because I don't later in this piece, class and cultural expectations, and the weight and meaning given to religious, scientific, and other um, knowledges. Um, in the context of pain, just put very simply, in the context of pain, it makes a difference um, whether uh, it was inflicted by an infuriated deity, whether it emerged out of a lifetime of um, bad habits, whether it was due to the uh, ebbs and flows of humours inside the body, or whether it's due to the invasion of a germ. As a consequence, metaphors for pain are culturally specific, and these metaphors fundamentally alter the way people pain is experienced for members of those groups. That pain, I mean, the, probably the... The most work that's been done on this looks at the way pain is described in different language groups. Um, um, as, and this has been used as showing the cultural specificity of pain. Thus, for example, the famous McGill pain questionnaire has to be adapted for non-English language speakers. As two Finnish experts reported, it is simply not possible to translate this kind of vocabulary into our language without losing its validity, since no dictionary contains reliable and meaningful categories or intensity equivalents. 
Indeed, in particular, they found that the punishment category of the McGill Payne questionnaire, with its English language link to uh, connection to the idea of retribution for some real or imagined sin, was simply incomprehensible to Finnish um, speakers. Um, the uh, Finnish cultural milieu unable to associate pain with punishment. And there's also a huge, a real vast literature um, drawing from other cultures. Um, the real, the best ones um, uh, deal with uh, various groups in, um, in Japan and in China. Um, but if we can talk about that later if you want, but other people have done that work. But my question is, well, okay, what about pain narratives in Britain and America? And this is what I do, uh, my current project does, a detailed, meticulous analysis of languages of pain from the 1760s um, to the 1960s. In these narratives, it is easy to find, for example, first-generation immigrants using metaphors based on their original culture. And here, the, the best ones, evidence that I've got for this, is new immigrants from China, um, Chinese, Italian, and Greek. Um, immigrants, where you can look at their pain narratives, particularly from the late 19th century, and see how different they are from, um, from others in, in, in Britain and America. Um, um, and as a consequence, of course, uh, seriously confusing their Anglo physicians, who are co consequently prone to dismiss their descriptions of pain as feigned, psychosomatic, exaggerated, or otherwise unreal. But if you also look at the languages used by long-term members um, of uh, indigenous, if you like, of Anglo-American societies, we also see um, interesting changes. Many of the metaphors they use for pain are consistent over the period I am studying and very much fit the embodiment um, uh, model that, that I mentioned earlier. And some of the, the most common ones are these ones, and I have for each of these, I've got many, many examples. Um, pain is laying low, um, dying man, 1822, exhausted with pain and grief, um, and ready almost to sink into despondency. Pain as heat or fire, working man, 1820s, torn skin, smoked almost like a kiln. Um, pain is being devoured, um, it ate me up. Uh, pain is an entity within a person. We already saw an example of, um, of this, but you're writhing inside me. Pain is war, crack of a pistol. Um, uh, and I'll come back because that's an important one that does undergo a little bit of change. Pain is a whirlwind, um, sweeping everything in its wake. Um, patient, turn of the century. Um, my suffering was so great, suffering so great as I underwent cannot be expressed in words, the blank whirlwind of emotion, the horror of great, of great darkness and the sense of desertion by God and man, bordering close upon despair which swept through my mind and overwhelmed my heart I can never forget. Pain is an animal. Um, 1934, um, closer and closer the animal came and soon his claws were upon my flesh and the pain would swoop down. These are the most common metaphors that I find all the way through consistently in the period I'm, I'm dealing with. Now, what's more interesting than that, I think, are the metaphors that change. Um, within Anglo-American pain narratives, um, the three most important categories of change are these three. Um, in other words, they're change which reflect shifts in medical knowledge, from humoral, th humoral theory to physiological, biological, molecular, uh, and later genetic, which goes past my period, understandings of the body. Second, shifts in religious and secular languages. And third, environmental shifts, uh, particularly industrialization. And I just want to give three very, very quick examples, if you like, of how these... Um, how the, this has changed things. Humorial theory, for instance, provided a rich language of ebbs and flows of phlegm, black bile, yellow bile, and blood, and the personality uh, types associated with these humors, which were absolutely crucial in pain narratives. So according to the humorial um, um, metaphorical languages, pain was this was fluid. Uh, the relationship between the outside and the inside was not so um, clearly defined. Um, flow, there's sweats, um, uh, there's things being absorbed, and so on. And it's fundamentally about interaction between uh, this corporeal self and outside um, and the outside world. 
Um, and these are, of course, very unlike the more mechanistic whole organ uh, descriptions of later metaphors. And in particular, you see the, the intervention of metaphors of invasion and penetration that came to dominate pain talk with germ theory in, in, in particular. Also, differences in uh, shifts due to um, secularization or uh, the importance of religion. Virginia Woolf um, famously argued that, she basically argued that people have a rich language um, of Shakespeare for love poetry, but only a thin one for pain. In her words, English, which can express the thoughts of Hamlet and the tragedy of Lear, has no, word, no words for the shiver and the headache. The merest schoolgirl, when she falls in love, has Shakespeare um, to speak her mind for her. But let a sufferer try to describe a pain in his head to a doctor, and language at, la at once runs dry. Now, this may have been a valid point slightly. I think it's grossly exaggerated in the 1930s when she's writing, but it's certainly, of course, not the case in the earlier periods. And in particular, Christianity provided a rich language of suffering from Job to Jonah to Jesus. Just to take uh, one example, um, the illness of William Tharp Buchanan, 1837, at the age of 21, he had fallen um, down a hillside onto some rocks and severely um, injured his, his um, spine, causing him to be bedridden for the rest of his life. One day, uh, which wasn't very long, <laughs> a few years, um, one day a visiting friend came and found him, found me desponding, melancholy, note the language of humours, in a melancholic state of mind and harassed with much bodily suffering. Like the psalmist, I seem to say, oh, I am weary of my groaning, I am troubled, I am bowed down greatly, I go mourning all the day long. My loins are filled with a lonesome degree disease. There is no soundness of my flesh. He went on invoking the language of fluids, heavy, unbalanced, under the judgment of a wrathful God. And actually, in these older ones, judgment is, is, is one of the crucial uh, metaphors. Oh, that my grief were thoroughly weighed and my calamity laid in the balance together, for now it would be heavier than the sound of the sea. Therefore, my words are swallowed up, for the arrows of the Almighty are with me, the poison whereof drinketh up my spine, the terrors of God do set themselves in array against me. Job 6. This is a world away, of course, from the secular metaphors of the later period, with the emphasis not on subjugation and submission to the pain, but on precisely the opposite, fighting and, and ultimately conquering the pain. And one of the things I'm really interested in, I can't give a straightforward answer now, is when um, that shift exactly when fighting metaphors become the chief uh, metaphor for talking about pain. But it is actually quite late um, in, in the century, in the 19th century, when fighting them uh, come, uh, comes forward. And this is all a quantitative analysis that I'm, that I'm doing. And the final example refers to changes in people's environment, which introduce new forms of metaphors that simply weren't there um, before. And the most, what I think is the most sudden and strikingly sudden one here is um, the introduction of railway metaphors. Um, it's no coincidence that the fascination and panic in the mid-19th century over railways, and in particular railway accidents, entered quick in metaphorical languages very, very quickly. So it's not there, and suddenly it's one of the major metaphors being used. Um, as one physician described um, uh, the pain of uh, neuralgia, 1860s, 1862, he said, I have seen the most heroic and stout-hearted men shed tears like a child, um, it's his syntax, not mine, like a child when enduring the agony, as in a powerful engine when the director turns some little key and the monster is at once aroused and plunges along the pathway, screaming and breathing forth flames in the majesty of his power. So the hero of a hundred battles, if perchance a figment of nerve is compressed, is seized with spasms and struggles to escape the unendurable agony. So here... Are metaphors of industry and pain, and sorry, and, and war. Pain is a mechanical monster that reduces war heroes to children. Pain is a scream, brutal like a foghorn. It is the searing heat of a stoked engines. As in railway accidents, 
It bears down upon a person almost by rand randomly, fixing on any particular individual by chance. And the cause of disaster may be simple and small, simply the compression of a filament of nerve, but it's all powerful, inescapable. Okay, so far my emphasis has been on language. However, gesture, inarticulate utterances, symbols, ah, and posture, sorry, um, are central components of human communication. Meaning does not simply emerge from a disembodied, from, emerge from, from a disembodied in the mind analysis of abstract speech sounds, and neither is it dependent on the prescription, perception of the formal mechanisms of language, vocabulary, syntax, tense, and so on. It's also dependent on gesture and performance, the cries, screams, moans, grasping of wounds, rocking back and forth of bodily pain are sounds and movements which are part of the gestural language or gestural basis of language. And in pain experiences, gestural aspects of communication effectively convey worlds of meaning and may actually be truer to the corporeal feel of pain. As one physician expressed it in 1897, the haggard features and shaking frame bore out undoubted testimony to the unendurable pain of undergoing an operation without anesthetics. It was a point observed by John Townsend, reflecting on his time in a poor law um, hospital infirmary in the middle of the 19th century. He wrote eloquently of the world of woe compressed within the walls of that hospital, here, he observed, was a convulsive sob, there a deep groan, yonder a piercing shriek, what dreary, lonely nights, and how deep and solemn the midnight tongue of time is heard by the agonizing, wakeful patients. And this is a working class uh, man writing, and again, as is typical, just before that rather eloquent passage, he um, says we cannot talk about, uh, about pain. In Townsend's account, pain is conceived of as a convulsion, um, uh, moving um, heavily deep within a damaged flesh. All night, the tongue of time passing in agonizing slowness, literally speaking um, to patients in torment. As communicative acts between people and pain, people in pain and positions, gestural and facial expressions are particularly important in the days of pre-scientific um, medicine where diagnosis was dependent upon these pain narratives and outward comportment. In these earlier diagnostic textbooks, and as a footnote also in late 20th century ones for completely different reasons, evolutionary psychology and um, reintroduction of narrative-based medicine, but in the earlier uh, uh, textbooks, the attention of physicians was routinely drawn to the unmistakable appearance of the face of pain. In the 19th century, the science of physiognomy, um, reading uh, the, uh, the person by, by the positioning of, of face tissue and, and bones, bewitched, of course, many in the medical profession, inviting claims, as in one account in 1859, that the intelligent practitioner must always pay attention to the state of the countenance, since it was the mirror of the soul. But reliance on these pain narratives and gesture were increasingly being undermined. Analgesics and aesthetics disrupted coherent pain narratives, a factor much lamented by surgeons like James Arnold um, in the question considered, is it justifiable to administer chloroform in surgical operations, 1854, um, where he spoke about the problems because you get a dial, um, delusional uh, expression of thought, delirious, sorry, delirious expression of thought. Pain narratives did become less rich in metaphor and rhetorical flourishes because of the increasing sense that pain fulfilled no function, either for the patient or for the physician. In other words, pain increasingly being stripped of its wider meaning as redemptive, for example, for the patient, or diagnostic um, for the physician, and reduced to a physiological um, body um, and its <coughs> sensations, and also reduced to the individual 
as opposed to the social, which dominated pain narratives in the earlier period, and of course, uh, notoriously difficult to express. Furthermore, patient descriptions of pain and the evidence presented by the physiognomy, the countenance, and by gesture were increasingly being doubted. From the early 20th century, the value of pain narratives of their sufferings declined in, its importance. in importance as knowledges taken from microbiology, chemistry, physiology enabled physicians to bypass patient narratives in their search for objective narrative, objective diagnosis. And of course, other people have done work on this in connection with technologies such as stethoscopes, etc. The view that certain illnesses elicited certain sensations, which of course was a great pride for um, physicians in the early period, was of course discredited. As Kremner and Atkinson advised, physicians often assumed that the pain of heart attack is characterized as squeezing, crushing, or choking. Ulcer is gnawing and burning. Back pain is aching. Nerve root compression is sharp and stabbing. And the pain of um, abdominal um, viscera is sickening. Unfortunately, they observed these descriptions could not, never be mapped onto various disturbances because pain patients are distressed. So pain descriptions moved from the patient narrative of the earlier diagnostic textbooks to the laboratory um, ones, uh, descriptions. There was no systematic uh, relationship, medical commentators increasingly insisted, between language and diagnostic categories. Even more important, um, the mores of scientific medicine were increasingly hostile to emotion in medical practice, seeing it as working against scientific objectivity. And everyone here will be aware of the very famous uh, statement by uh, William, Sir William Osler, 1904, in his lecture to graduating medical students at the University of Pennsylvania, advising them that Ability was what was necessary. It was an essential bodily virtue and a blessing to the uh, possessor. Although some uh, physicians, he argued, due to congenital defects, may never acquire it, with education and practice, many actually could. And in his words, and this is the most famous thing uh, he wrote, which is familiar. Um, a certain measure of insensibility is not only an advantage, but a positive necessity in the exercise of calm judgment and in carrying out del delicate operations. Keen sensibility is doubtless a high virtue of high order when it does not interfere with the steadiness of hand or coolness of nerve. But the practitioner in his working day world but for the practitioner in his working day world, a callousness which thinks only of the good to be effected and goes ahead regardless of smaller considerations is the preferred quality. From the 1950s in particular, the correct relationship between patient and physician was theorized in terms of detached concern. And there's a wonderful article on this um, by Jack Coolenham. Um, where he argues that detached concern reflected prevalent role models of disease and medical intervention. In this model, disease was considered an insult or a process that disrupts the body and can, in principle, be completely understood in anatomical, physiological, biochemical, or even molecular terms. Is existential and spiritual suffering that results from disease or trauma is expected to resolve when the disease is cured, alleviated, or controlled. Okay, just to tie this all up here, um, I started my talk by alluding to Margaret Edson's uh, play Wit, and in which a uh, scholar of 17th century poetry, Vivian Berry, struggled to answer the question, how are you feeling today? and her despair about the feigned solicitude of those around her. Part of the problem, as she recognized, was the assumption that the body in pain will elicit sympathy. This was most brilliantly argued by the anthropologist Margaret Mead. She argued that pain was, quote, a form of human experience so sharp, so unmistakable, so immediate, that members of any culture can recognize, empathize, or identify with another human being in pain. The cry of genuine, note that, the cry of genuine anguish knows no linguistic boundaries, and fortitude under the needle and the knife 
needs no interpreters. On the contrary, people routinely failed to hear others in pain. Indeed, Mead hints at this herself by claiming that it's only genuine cries of anguish that constitutes a universal language, thus opening the door, of course, to claims that a person testifying to be in pain is actually not, not genuine. Nevertheless, if we listen closely, pay, paying attention to the language of pain, it emerges in many and complex and historically nuanced ways. It is not, as Scarry would have it, that pain forces an unmaking of the world, but that it encourages a different kind of making. As Janice McLean reminds us, pain is not simply a heap of incoherent sensations. It is a structure with its own affective, its own bodily, its own cognitive frameworks. And the framework created by pain can be very different, is very different from the framework associated with pleasurable or even emotionally neutral um, experiences. The body in pain is extraordinarily focused upon the cause, the intensity, the temporality of the sensation. But as is true when communicating and giving experiences expressing meaning to other experiences, these concerns are not devoid of content and meaning. Again, quoting the claim, they still refer to the wounds that cause the pain and the state of wished for normality. These are the foreground and background, the signification by which pain gives life unpleasant meaning. In other words, a painful world is still a world of meaning, although, of course, in a very different way to a non-painful world. Paradoxically, the fictive figure Vivian Baring, with her sense of alienation and isolation and loneliness in her slow and very painful dying, and scholars Virginia Woolf and Elaine Scarry with their acute literary sensibilities, which led them to despair about the thinness of pain narratives, actually identified something profound in the nature of pain. It is by those features that of pain that life is giving its, given its meaning, its unpleasant meaning. Through metaphorical languages and gestures, people in pain convey that meaning of pain, the feeling of pain. The ways in which these discourses, these languages, these storytellings changed over historical time enables historians to access states of pain. Thanks.